So my job right now is to introduce my new BFF. Um, I still get excited when I get a text from her at night. It's really cool. And last July, uh, I had the opportunity to meet the first president, first female president of the United States. Well, and at least the first one on television, right? <laughs> Uh, the former Commander-in-Chief and Academy Award-winning actor, Gina Davis. And I cannot tell you how thrilled I am that this day came together, that you all are all here because you're part of a dream. My husband isn't here, but he would tell you he's so tired of me waking up in the middle of the night and going, Bill, I've got the greatest idea. So you all are part of one of those coming true, and thank you so much. Um, like many of you all, it has been a thrill to get to know Gina. Who could forget Thelma and Louise? Uh, when Senator Smith said, are you all the new Thelma and Louise? I said, um, Senator, did you actually see the end of that movie? <laughs> and a league of their own, of course, and that's why today we are celebrating our own league of their own with our panel. But Gina's smile, uh, her personality, her acting ability, um, but I've had the real true pleasure of seeing a different side than is on screen and one that I really have loved, and that is the compassionate, ardent, advocate that she is for everyone in this room and for girls of the future in our country and around the world. Um, and I'm appreciative of the fact that she has actually used her celebrity for making a difference. So important. She's been a positive difference for girls here, obviously, and all around the world. Um, and just, was it just last week that we were in Geneva? Oh my gosh. Anyway, just last week she was designated as the newest special envoy for the ITU and also their laureate for 2012, along with some pretty heady company, the president of Argentina and the CEO of the world's largest uh, cell company, Huawei, in China. So congratulations, Gina. And I won't steal her statistics, but you all are going to hear more of her watching television with her young daughter and noticing the lack of female roles, and um, especially in careers that, uh, and in leading kind of roles and professional careers. But like any good commander in chief, Gina decided to actually do something about it. So she founded the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media that you all will hear about and has spearheaded some of the largest body of research ever done. I will just share one statistic, and that is that if we do nothing, it will take us 500 years to get parity with males, and I am not ready to wait 500 years. So. I also want to make sure that you all have met Madeline Denono, who actually runs the Institute along with Gina. We're so glad that you're here in Nashville as well. Um, she has taken this message, and an ardent, strong message, I might add, from Hollywood to the halls of Congress, um, and again was just awarded these incredible awards in Geneva last week. So I am so proud to serve as co-chair with Gina of the Healthy Media Commission, and especially to welcome you to Nashville. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the stage helped us uh, not be a sight gag, so that uh, I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, and, uh, and thank you so much for bringing me to Nashville, uh, Debbie. I appreciate it. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with all of you this afternoon. And uh, I want to thank everyone at Lipscomb, especially uh, Dr. Norma Burgess, and uh, of course also the Andrews Institute for Civic Leadership, and uh, Linda Peek Schott, who I met earlier today, and uh, who's a wonderful inspiration. Um, so uh, before we start, I mean, you, know, you may have some idea uh, of what I might be like from having seen a movie I'm in or something like that. And uh, I just wanted to let you know that, that this is always a little weird for me to be, oh, I'm standing here giving a speech because to me, I'm just still the same dorky kid that I was um, growing up in a small town in Massachusetts. Uh, it's, actually, it's funny because I was just talking about this with the driver in the motorcade on the way over. 
how I'm still the same as I was. <laughs> okay, well, we'll put away a few of these pages. Uh, <laughs> So evidently, um, I announced to my parents when I was three that I intended to be an actor. I, I don't remember this, but that's what they say. Um, I'll digress for just one second to explain why I call myself an actor instead of an actress. Uh, if, you, if you look up the word actor in the dictionary, it says a person who acts. It doesn't say a male person. Uh, so I, I feel like we don't really need the little re on the end to... Uh, uh, you know, denote uh, femaleness. And in fact, I think actress soon will seem as quaint as doctoress, a poetess, remember authoress and all those. So uh, I, I consider myself um, an actor who used to be a waiter. <laughs> that, yes. Uh, so back to age three, I, I can't imagine what it was that decided me on this course, but uh, my goal never wavered. And uh, when it came time for college, I decided that I was going to major in acting at Boston University, which is a great idea, major in acting, because it always works out. <laughs> my, uh, my whole family, I, my, all of us were so removed from show business that when I told my parents, you know, I planned to major in acting, they were like, oh, well, fine, you know, great, whatever, as if I'd said, I'm going to major in engineering or dentistry or something where you actually get a job um, <laughs> after going to college. Uh, my very first role, I was really fortunate, was in uh, Tootsie. I mean, that, it's like unbelievable. How do you get to be, your first job is in a movie with Dustin Hoffman. So I remember overhearing a friend of my mom's talking to her about it. Oh my God, we can't believe it. It's so incredible. It's amazing. <laughs> my mom says, well, she studied acting. <laughs> It always works out. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, whatever the odds, I had this sort of just idiotic, unshakable faith that I was going to be an actor. Um, so I thought I would share with you today a few stories about roles that I've played that have really changed my life and taking me down paths uh, that were never part of my master plan. Um, when I got cast in A League of Their Own, um, I was supposed to play the best baseball player anyone had ever seen. And the problem was that I didn't know how to play baseball or any other sport. I was, uh, you know, my torture in high school was uh, being the tallest kid in class. Everybody has something. And so I was very, you know, gangly, and I, I just didn't uh, perceive myself as being very athletic. Uh, but. Uh, but I you know, took the role serious, I trained hard, and uh, soon the coaches started saying, you know, you have some, some untapped athletic ability, which was a great compliment. But what I found was that learning how to play a sport really affected how I saw myself and my body. Uh, for the first time in my life, I felt like, it's okay to be tall, it's okay to take up space, uh, it's okay to use your body, because it can actually do things. Um, for most of my life, I had not felt truly comfortable with myself and that I wasn't somehow faking it or, or I never believed that I truly deserved to be successful until sports dramatically improved my, my self-image. It turned out that I was coordinated. It just took until I was 36 to find that out. <laughs> so what I learned from uh, playing sports uh, encouraged me to get in touch with the Women's Sports Foundation, which uh, encourages girls' participation in sports uh, because I wanted to help young girls discover what I had learned about body image but decades before I had. Um, so I ended up serving uh, for 10 years as a trustee of the Women's Sports Foundation, which uh, was, had a big impact on my life. Uh, the film that had the most impact on my life was um, Thelma and Louise, which essentially changed the course of my life. Um, None of us realized before the movie came out that we were making anything that was in any way exceptional. You know, uh, We knew it was a very good script. It was unusual because it had two uh, very well-written uh, female characters in the lead. But uh, we didn't know that it was going to turn out to be significant. Nothing stood out to us except you know, maybe we'd drive off the cliff at the end. Well, now I gave the ending away. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, before the movie came out, 
people recognize me here and there, you know, at the supermarket or whatever, and say something like, you know, I actually liked Earth Girls Are Easy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, but as soon as the movie came out, it was, it was extraordinary. I had people just you know, grab me by the lapels so I would stay while they told me about the movie meant to them. And oh my god, it was so incredible. And, and uh, my friend and I acted out your trip. <laughs> or uh, you know, uh, cars full of women would honk at me at red lights. And oh my god. Or, and there was all these, I don't know if you remember, there were all these uh, passionate editorials at the time about, oh my god, you know, now the women have guns, uh, everything's, <laughs> everything's ruined. Um, so if I had ever needed a lesson in the power of media images, I certainly had one now, uh, because it brought home to me in a very stark way how few opportunities we give women to feel like this about the female characters in a movie, to come out of a movie feeling uh, excited and exhilarated and inspired. So ever since that movie, I've made my acting choices with the women in the audience in mind. Uh, how will the women watching feel about my character? And can my character be in charge of her own fate? Uh, and I, I don't look for role model parts, mind you. I mean, if you think about Thelma Louise, um, we, uh, we kill a guy, evade the law, drive drunk, uh, have sex with a stranger, and kill ourselves. So <laughs> as far as I hope we reenacted your trip goes, I'm just <laughs> still stuck on that. My next big lesson in life uh, came from being cast as the first uh, woman president on television. And when they offered me this part, I was like, how did they know? Uh, <laughs> it was so perfect to me. It, it just, uh, you know, with my empowerment proclivities for women, I mean, what could be more iconic than getting to play the president? But, but this also led me into a whole, uh, a whole new realm for me of women's advancement. Uh, because through the film, I got to know Marie Wilson, who was the founder of the White House Project. I don't know if you ever heard of that. It's a nonprofit that advocates for more women to hold leader, leadership positions, both in politics and uh, in business. And I had been aware, as everybody is, of how there were fewer women holding public office than men. But I really, I had no idea of the extent of the problem. Um, did you know that the United States ranks 90th in the world as far as female representation in government? 90th. I mean, quick, name 89 countries. Uh, it's really astounding because, you know, Americans, we tend to think of ourselves as, you know, leader. We're leading the way. We're showing how it's done and, and just profoundly not in this case. And uh, uh, Debbie was talking about, um, there was a study done by the New York Times Magazine which showed that if we add women to Congress at the rate that we have been, we will achieve parity in 500 years. Uh, but I say, boldly, that we dedicate ourselves today to cutting that in half. <laughs> so the fact is that women are seriously underrepresented across every sector of society, but for the most part, we're not really aware of the true extent of this. The, the White House Project did a report a couple of years ago where uh, they looked at 10 sectors of society to figure out what is the percentage of women in positions of authority and leadership. And uh, it was you know, business, law, politics, uh, media, academia, et cetera. And they found that across the board, across all these 10 most important sectors of society, the average percentage was about 17%. Across all these sectors of society, everything had stalled out at about 17%. And it, it makes you wonder, you know, how, how can that be? How could it be that across the board this happens? But once you start, maybe you'll start noticing now, 17% turns out to be sort of everywhere. Um, the percentage of women in Congress is actually 16%. It went down from 17. 17% uh, of movie narrators 
uh, are women. It's also the percentage of women in the Animators Guild. Uh, my body fat is 17%. <laughs> it's weird how it's kind of everywhere, right? <laughs> so this is why I think that research is so important because the facts dispel the myths and misconceptions. I really believe that, that facts are the most important tool uh, to change minds. And sponsoring research has become very significant in my life uh, in at least the past six years. Uh, I founded my research institute called the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media because I wanted the data on one very specific thing, which was how many female characters were there in entertainment media made for kids, for little kids. Because when my daughter was about two years old, she's 10 now, Alizé, um, we started watching you know, things with her, little G-rated videos and things. And with this sort of spidey sense that I had about uh, women's roles in, the, uh, in media, I was stunned to see that there seemed to be far fewer female characters than male characters in what little kids were being shown. Uh, there's obviously notable exceptions like, like Dora the Explorer and, uh, and uh, preschool shows, especially on uh, PBS, uh, tend to be quite balanced. So, so we're doing great in that area. But uh, I started checking around. I asked my friends, had they noticed you know, that this was going on? No. And then uh, I started asking around in the industry because I hadn't at this time uh, decided that I was going to, you know, launch a whole new uh, phase of my life over this. But um, when I asked people in the industry, producers or studio execs, whatever, have you noticed how few female characters there are in G-rated movies? They would, to a person, say, oh, no, 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 that's been fixed. And then they would name a movie with one female character in it as proof that the problem of not enough female characters has been fixed. So th that made me realize nobody is picking up on this. Um, and uh, if I want to really try to have an impact, I need the data because obviously my impression is not having any, uh, any carrying any weight. Um, because it occurred to me as a mother that our kids in the 21st century should be seeing boys and girls sharing the sandbox equally, for heaven's sake. Uh, so. My friends and I raised some money and we sponsored the largest research study that ever been done on uh, G-rated movies and children's television programs. It was conducted at USC's Annenberg School for Communication by Dr. Stacy Smith and the report was eventually titled Where the Girls Aren't. Uh, we have since sponsored the largest body of research ever done into gender representations in media in the family film ratings, uh, G, PG, and PG-13. And the results are, are frankly stunning. The world view that our culture is reflecting to children is incredibly unbalanced. Uh, for every one female character, there are three male characters, unless it's a crowd scene in which only 17% <laughs> of the characters are female. Hmm. Uh, and significantly, over the 20 year period that we've now studied, there was, there was no uh, improvement at all in the numbers of female characters. Well, I shouldn't say no improvement. There was enough improvement that if we add characters at the rate they have been for the last 20 years, we will achieve parity in uh, 700 years. <laughs> so we also looked at the female characters, obviously, who do exist and what are they like. And uh, the vast majority were highly uh, stereotyped and or hypersexualized. Uh, this is kind of shocking, that the, the G-rated animated characters wear the same amount of sexually revealing clothing as R-rated female characters. And in animated films, because you can draw the characters any way you want, um, the majority of female characters have a waist so tiny uh, that not only could it not exist in, in real life, but it's, it's questionable if you could fit a spinal column in, in there. <laughs> Um, one of the most common occupations for female characters in G-rated movies was uh, royalty, which is a nice gig if you can get it. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Uh, so, so knowing all this, we have to ask ourselves, what message are we sending 
to boys and girls at, the, at an incredibly vulnerable age, we're talking about kids 11 and under, if the female characters are one-dimensional, sidelined, narrowly stereotyped, hypersexualized, or simply not there at all, we are communicating to children that women are less valuable to society than men and boys, and that women and girls don't take up half the space in the world. And the message is sinking in because the more hours of television a girl watches, the fewer options she thinks she has in life. And the more hours a boy watches, the more sexist his views become. So clearly, there is a strong negative message about women being um, imprinted on kids. And we're feeding them this from the very beginning. And so in effect, we are training a new generation. We're enculturating them to unconsciously take in that women are less important than men, both genders. So what can we do? Well, in medicine, uh, the cure often comes from the same source as the, as the disease. And uh, the good news is that media, being so powerful as it is, can have the same effect in a positive direction. It can powerfully influence uh, boys and girls to see girls differently. Um, it can create opportunities to overcome social barriers. For example, we know that if girls watch female characters in unstereotyped activities, they will be much more likely to later pursue untraditional occupations. Uh, in other words, if they see it, they can be it. Clearly, gender equality is an idea whose time has more than come. So why has progress stalled out in all sectors of society? I think one reason is that it's a very common and human trait to think that progress happens naturally. It happens on its own. Over time, things change and they change for the better. Or you think that, like the studio executives, uh, that the change has already happened. Um, it's very true in my industry where it's periodically announced, well, now things, now things are better for women actors, but it has yet to prove to be the case because the percentage of, the ratio of male to female characters has been the same since 1946. No change. Uh, because change doesn't happen easily. And where gender equality is concerned, as we see, sometimes it utterly stalls out. But uh, I like to consider myself the same way uh, Bill and Melinda Gates talk about themselves as impatient optimists. And I'm sure that all of you in the room uh, share that idea because the time for change has, has more than come, as we said. And there are powerful agents of change in this room, all of us. We are all powerful agents of change. And we will embrace what Dr. Martin Luther King called the fierce urgency of now. We can't wait to see if real gender equality comes in the natural course of time because all the evidence shows us that it will not. The lives of girls are at stake. Uh, Professor Amartya Sen, a Nobel Prize winner, tells us that every year, two million girls go missing because of inequality and neglect. Women and girls are missing not just as fictional characters on screen, but in the cold light of day. And we need, in all sectors of society, to add women. We need more women both in the media, uh, in front of the camera and behind the camera, in the realms of, of business and academia and law and the military. We need more women leaders. The people reporting the news and the people making the news, we need to have more women. And to the ranks of policymakers and corporate boards and justices and presidents and prime ministers, we need to add women, include women, encourage women, vote for women, and hire women. I want the day, <laughs> thank you. I want the day to come soon when I can uh, share this story with my daughter, that once upon a time, uh, women and girls held a lesser position in the world than men and boys. And she would turn, and, uh, turn to me and look with an incredulous expression and then say, Mom, that's just a fairy tale. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.